My name is Melissa Sestaro, and I have the honor and pleasure tonight of introducing one of my absolute favorite writers, who I can also say is one of the most remarkable storytellers of our time, Colin McCann. Colin is the best-selling author of the novel Zoli, Dancer, This Side of Brightness, Song Dogs, and two collections of short stories. His stunning book, Let the Great World Spin, won the National Book Award in 2009 and went on to be published in 35 languages. And just two years ago, we had a wonderful event when Colin came to talk about his fantastic novel, Transatlantic. And now once again, Colum takes us on a dazzling journey with his latest book, 13 Ways of Looking. There is such power in these stories. And I'm not going to tell you specifically what these four stories are about, but I can tell you what you might experience when you read them, or at least I'll share my experience of what happened to me. So many times I had to look up from the page and just take in what I had just read, and really to think and reflect on a sentence, an image, a moment. And then I found myself taking out a notebook, and I titled it, How Does Colin McCann Do This? <laughs> uh, and I think he has this capability because he is undeniably one of those writers that asks us to think deeply. And he can also turn a tale in a direction that you never see coming or imagined. I cannot say enough about this remarkable storytelling that happens in this new book. Please join me in welcoming the dashing, talented <laughs> Colin McCann. great introduction like that, plus with an element of humor, dashing, like dashing through the snow. <laughs> One horse opal sleigh. Um, it is fabulous to be back here in what has to be uh, one of my absolute favorite bookstores anywhere in the world. All right. I, 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 really, I don't know if it's uh, the atmosphere or the, the people who, who gather here, or the people who make the atmosphere, or the, the landscape, or coming. I have a, um, a, a little piece of nostalgia as I came across the Golden Gate Bridge. I was coming in a nice, fancy car, uh, driven by a, a very kind gentleman by the name of Jerry. And uh, what I wanted to tell him, and didn't quite tell him, was that 30 years ago, I went across the self-same bridge on an 18-speed Schwinn. <laughs> um, some of you all, uh, and, and um, with two pannier bags. At that stage, I had, um, I had hair, uh, <laughs> and uh, I had a big beard on me, I was scruffy, and I'd finished a 12,000-mile journey um, wow. across the United States wow. and Mexico and Canada. But um, the, the pivotal moment being stopping on the Golden Gate Bridge, and the reason I got caught up a little bit with it today was because um, there used to be a phone um, in the middle of the bridge. Is it still there? Um, there, was a, there was a pay phone. Um, I, I, at least that's what I remember. Maybe I'm just lying and inventing it for myself. Certainly there were no cell phones because it was uh, 1987 or, uh, uh, yeah, 1987 I think it was. And um, uh, I called my father and, 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 and wept. And, uh, and uh, coming back today, uh, I lost my father uh, in February of this year. Uh, but I remember it was one of the one of the big moments for him and for me, because uh, I'd gone across uh, the country to discover what storytelling uh, was all about. And um, I used to laugh with my good friend Frank McCourt that um, I was so annoyed at him uh, because he got all the misery in Ireland. <laughs> and left none for me. And so I had to go out and invent my own misery and, 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 and travel and meet people. But um, um, 
you know that 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 journey, when, whether it was like being down in Mississippi uh, with a poor family in Mississippi, being in Colorado with uh, you know fantastic uh, wealth and background, being in uh, in Gallup, New Mexico, being in Mexico itself, uh, uh, being along the uh, the Russian River, Monterio. I had a crazy night in Monterio, California. <laughs> <laughs> uh, completely crazy with a guy who spent seven years in San Quentin prison uh, for murder. <laughs> Uh, him and his wife were there. She said she was she was um, reincarnated from Queen Victoria. He said he liked me so he wouldn't kill me. <laughs> it was one of those, uh, and I had all sorts of uh, crazy uh, adventures. So that moment of nostalgia particularly hit home today because it was so um, perfect for me. I remember um, my father picking up the phone uh, and saying, okay, uh, you know, now it's time for you to become the writer that you want to become. One of the reasons why I, I went on the bicycle was because I tried to sit down and write a novel, um, and I thought that I had nothing to write about um, at that stage, and it's true. I had really uh, nothing to write about, but um, you know, it took me a number of years, uh, about, about another five years or so, to properly um, get published. Uh, but I will never forget uh, the texture of that moment of being I thought it was in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge. Someone <laughs> proved me wrong at some stage. Maybe it was on the top of it or it wasn't. It probably yeah. was right. Yeah. And it was just, and I remember being in floods of tears and thinking about it. So, um, anyway, um, I'm going to um, uh, read to you this evening. Another reason to be a little bit sad is that last time I was back here, uh, Michael Court was, uh, was around. And we lost uh, Michael just uh, a few weeks ago, I think. We should. Uh, nobody has a glass, or a couple of you have a glass. We should, we'll, I have a glass, I raise a glass, and we'll take all the reports, right? Uh, and Michael in particular here. I know they had his memorial service. Some people here might have even been there. They had his memorial service uh, this weekend. I missed it, unfortunately. Um, but I was there in spirit. Um, so this is a novella and a. Um, uh, and, and three stories. Um, their provenance is strange, and I'll probably tell you more about it as, as time goes on uh, this evening. Um, but um, I will just tell you this, that in the middle, or three quarters of the way uh, through writing uh, this story, this particular story, which is about uh, a New York judge, uh, an 82-year-old man who gets sort of randomly punched in the chest, or seemingly randomly punched in the chest, and, and dies in, in New York. I was at a conference for empathy of all things in New Haven, Connecticut, and got punched in the back of the head and ended up uh, on and off in the hospital for a couple of months. Um, and, um, and, um, it was only when I got a chance to write my victim impact statement uh, to talk about what had happened to me and what I think thought should happen to the perpetrator who confessed and he was beating his wife in the middle of the street when I got involved. And then I, I'd, done, I'd done everything. Listen, one of the things that's embarrassing about this, people think I got into a fray with some, some guy in, 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 in New Haven, Connecticut, some guy who was bigger than me. I wasn't that stupid. I mean, I, 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 he was as far away from me as, uh, as you are now. And I, ju I just said to him, he was beating her in the street, people were running. And I just said, leave her alone. Uh, and uh, I said, leave her, and, and, uh, or I'm going to call the cops. And um, he looked at me and uh, for a long time. And I knew he was going to attack me. He was either going to attack me, but I, was, I, I could have run away, uh, done, 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 done the Irish escape. <laughs> <laughs> or I could have stayed, and like, uh, and, 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 uh, but he's a lot bigger than me. So, um, but anyway, uh, he did. He left. It was great. I thought, okay, and I picked the woman off the street, and and, and, and and I said, you shouldn't be with a guy like that, and, and I said, do you want me to call the cops? And she said, no, and she tottered away, and I thought, I've done my Boy Scout thing. Went up to the hotel where I was staying. He obviously followed me, um, and outside the hotel, um, I was talking on the, on the telephone to my son, Johnny Michael, and I woke up two and a half hours later going into in, in an MRI machine. Thinking, oh, yeah. so, uh, so it was a so it was it was one of those cases of um, maybe fiction mm. preceding reality, mm -hmm. and then afterwards, after that, so I was completely paralyzed, unable to write uh, for months. Uh, then I wrote the victim impact statement, and then reality laying a map on 
uh, on the fiction. So I use the fiction then to, to, to inform some of what, what had gone on, which is all very serious. Um, and this little piece that I'm going to read to you is not quite so serious. Um, and it's just um, in Mendelssohn's head. It's early in the morning. He's in New York. He's on 86th Street. Uh, he uh, is um, he, he's a widower. His wife Eileen has passed away a good few years. And he is with a housekeeper by the name of Sally. He can hear Sally already up and at it in the kitchen. The rattle of spoons, the slide of the saucer, the touch of the teacup, the ping of the orange glass, the juicer being yanked from the cupboard, the soft sigh of the fridge's rubber tubing, the creak of the bottom drawer, the carrots coming out, the strawberries, the pineapple, the oranges, and then a serious clank of ice, the juice. Sally says he should call it a smoothie, but he doesn't like the word, simple as that. Nothing smooth <laughs> about it. He was on a shuffle in the park the other day. No other word. Every day a shuffle now. And he saw a young woman at the park benches near the reservoir with the word juicy, scrawled in pink across her rear end. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to admit, even at his age, that it wasn't far from the truth. <laughs> with all apologies to Eileen, of course, and Sally too, and Rachel and Reva and Denise and Mary Beth and Ava, no doubt, and Oprah and Brigitte and even Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> Why not? And all the other women of the world, sorry all, but it was indeed rather juicy. The way it bounced with the little boundary of dark skin above and the territory of shake below. And there was a time long ago, long ago, when he could have squeezed a thing or two out of that dough, don't talk to me of smoothies. <laughs> he had a reputation, but it was nothing but harmless fun. He never strayed, though he had to admit he leaned a little. <laughs> Sorry, Eileen. I leaned, I leaned, I leaned. Oh. It was more his conservative colleagues in the court who gave him the evil eye, a bunch of shriveled up prunes or prudes or both, and how in the world beyond party politics did they ever get elected? What do they think, that a man must hide his life in the judge's shroud? That he had to pop the errant head back under the shell? That the only noise he'd make was the gavel? No, 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 it was all about taking the rind of life, extract the liquid, forget the pulp, juice it up, the Jews juice, a smoothie. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, the whirl of the mind. Sorry, Eileen, I was passionate once and that's the word. Flirtatious maybe even, nothing more, never one to harass. That was something he passed on to young Elliot instead. More's a pity. Look at that poor boy now. But enough of all that. It's no way to start the day with his errant son, his wandering eyes, his hands, his ears, his throat, his wallet. Come, heat, hurry. He can hear the faint ticking begin. Rise up the pipes. <coughs> And why is it that New York never produced some boy genius to solve the heating problem? <laughs> Anybody who's been in New York knows the best. <laughs> You'd think with all the children born in this thumping metropolis that at least one of them would get miffed about the clank of pipes and the hiss of steam. <laughs> that they'd solve their everyday dilemma. But no, no, no. Off they go, make their millions on Wall Street, Broadway, in Palo Alto, and Los Alamos, and wherever else. <laughs> And still they come home to an apartment designed for cavemen. <laughs> <laughs> what is this godforsaken apartment worth anyway? Half a million twenty-seven years ago, sold the brownstone and Willow Street and made the trek to the Upper East Side. All to make Eileen happy. <coughs> she loved strolling by the great lawn, taking her ease around the reservoir, going on John's down to Greenberg's bakery. She even put a mezuzah by the front door <laughs> to protect the investment as much as anything else. <laughs> Two million dollars now, they say, 2.2, maybe 2.4, but they can't get the heating on before five in the morning. <laughs> we can put a black man in the White House, but we still can't get toasty. <laughs> we can send a mission to Mars, but we have to freeze a good man's cojones off on East 86 Street. <laughs> we can fit our blackberries into our hard side pajama pockets, but we can't get the steam up through the walls without a racket. Ah, oh, but here it comes. Here it comes, the first click of the day, as if there's a man down there wrenching open the pipes. <laughs> a second tick, and then a third, and then a whack. Crash, bang, wallop. Good man, Dante! <laughs> a divine comedy indeed. Abandon all hope. Jazz in the heating pipes. <laughs> if only 
Wake me up, Thelonious Monk. <laughs> Come dwell a while in my steam pipes. Visit the basin twilight around. Sally! He can hear the juicer crunching through the ice, the stammer of the blades, and the clack against the glass container. Sally! The juicer gradually slows down, the sound softening into silence. Sally! I'm up! Which, quite plainly, he is not. Neither one way or the other. <laughs> they, have hold, they have installed a hanging white bar at the side of the bed and a few other gadgets to help him levitate in the morning. Elliot wanted to put in a hoist at one stage, like he was some sort of giant shipping container. <laughs> you need a hoist, Dad. A hoist my ass, dear son. A hoist need the hoisters and not just for me oysters. <laughs> Eileen quite clearly would not be impressed. She liked poetry of an altogether different order, and she'd never quite cottoned on to his cheap little rhymes. She was a fan of that Irishman, Seamus Heaney, and she had a pension for another wild head of hair named Muldoon. <laughs> she would go to their readings every chance she got, chasing down the boisterous bards that always made him smile. He himself saw bulk poets at a Waldorf dinner once, they should have written a rhyme about the rubbery chicken and the slippery slop waitress. <laughs> he crossed the room, he stood in line, he took out his good fountain pen, and he got the poets to sign a cloth napkin, tucked it away. He was afraid he'd get caught white-handed, a judge to be judged. And he brought it home to Eileen, who clutched it to her nightgown, and then kissed him a worthy good night, I'll see you in my dreams. And here at last, the hard hiss of steam but that's some fucking noise this morning. He can feel it already begin to flood the room. Good morning, Thelonious. Time to rise and shine. Make God your glory, glory. Katya used to sing that to him long ago, along with her dreidel rhymes. He grabs a hold of the bar, swings his knees across, scoots himself up in the sheets, and God damn it all to hell, he can feel it now under his pajama buttons. She has put him in a pad. Plain and simple, by any other word, a diaper. And why the hell does she do it? Goddamn diaper. And when in the world did she slip it on? And what in the world does she think of my equipment? <laughs> <laughs> and how did he possibly forget? He can remember the sound of the traffic on Court Street 50 million years ago. He can remember Heaney at the Waldorf Muldoon too. He can remember being born as a young lawyer, for crying out loud. The tie shop on Montague, Katya and her nursery run. He can remember boarding the SOC3, but he can't remember Sally slapping him in a diaper just this morning. Mm -hmm. The dark dogs of the mind. Sally! Long and tall she is indeed, but quick on her feet she is not. Not the girl to Sally Fourth. Sally Eighth, more like it. Sally Ninth. <laughs> Come in, Mr. J. Well, so too is Hanukkah. So too is the 22nd century. So too is the end of the visible world. So it is the end of the visible world. And I use the, um, the poem um, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. I'm just going to read a little bit from, um, from a different sort of voice in the same story. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos, the blackbird whistling or just after. Poets, like detectives, know that the truth is laborious. It doesn't occur by accident, rather it's chiseled and worked into being the product of time and distance and graft. The poet must be open to the possibility that she has to go a long way before a word rises, or a sentence holds, or a rhythm opens, and even then nothing is assured, not even the words that have staked their original claim or meaning. Sometimes it happens at the most unexpected moment, and the poet has to enter the mystery, rebuild the poem from there. On the afternoon of his death, Mendelssohn emerges from the elevator. An uneventful ride, he stands alongside Sally James, and they walk together into the lobby. It is one of those ancient New York foyers, marble and flowers and chandeliers, brass wall lights, a mahogany table, black and white tiles, a long strip of carpet down the middle, bad art on the walls, the sort created expressly not to offend. Sally disappears around the corner a moment, and Mendelssohn takes a few steps alone. He wears a long overcoat, a Homburg hat, a drowsy determination on his face, the space awaiting his chronic fate. 
In Zoom, his eyes are hooded. The jaw is slack. He wears little half moons of fatigue beneath his spectacles. A burst of wrinkle from, wrinkles from around the eyes. Another little burst of hair from the side of his hat. His head deeply veined at the temples. Small sag of skin and the chicken wattle at his neck. The mark of decades. The detectives can imagine him at home, slack-mouthed in sleep, his pyjama collar askew, a light snore sailing from the back of his throat. But later, when he moves along the corridor, they notice a drop of joy in his shuffle. Not a sideways lean or bedraggled pull along, a man still attached to the world, a curmudgeonly grace. The detectives examine the walk as if the moment might carry a forensic clue to his being. They are well aware that a moment on its own, like a word, means little or nothing, but it is their accumulation that begins to make them matter. Life has been made strange by a series of actions, and so there must be a corresponding series of triggers. The past is a key to the future. Hidden causes must become plain. Time should move to a singular point of revelation. The thrill is in finding the point where the mystery is dismantled. Then they can jigsaw the logic back together. If they can find one piece, they will glimpse another nearby, test it for fit. The trick comes in the agility to see all the pieces at once, and they'll build outward and backward to commit the solution. On the day of the murder, they watch in real time, stopping, starting, chopping, rewinding, over and over again. Think, stop, rethink, watch Mendelssohn emerge, gaze at the storm, adjust his collar, kick the first snow off his shoe, lean against his nurse, see Sally laugh, see Tony nod, see Mendelssohn smile, see nothing odd, see Mendelssohn go, see the old man disappear, see the snow coming down. They wait, careful with the timestamp, to, to discover if anything happens in the intervening hour. But it is only the doorway, the awning, the pavement, the street, the increasing white of the storm, the return back into frame of Sally from the restaurant, with a nod to Tony and a blow of warm air in her hands, little else. For a while they wait for Mendelssohn to return from lunch, as if the video itself could trump reality. Later. The detectives slide back on the digital timeline to the moment when Mendelssohn steps out alive into the snowstorm. There is something of the Greek epic about it. The old grey man with his walking stick venturing into the snow, out of frame and away, like an ancient word stepping off a page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, little section about ancient words and um, stepping off of pages um, this is a very different story uh, and I'm only going to read a half page of it um, but anybody who knows Hebrew might know this word although it's a hard word it's a tough word to, um, and, and it took me a long time I don't know if you guys remember um, when I was here last time if anybody was here before I did a call out to the audience um, to ask if anybody knew a word in any language for um, for a parent who has lost a child. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of people came up afterwards, I still have the book, and somebody wrote down the word Viloma for me here in this very store. Um, wow. and, uh, and I did it in several other places <laughs> I, as I went around the country, uh, trying to find, there's no English yeah. word, there's no Irish word, and, and, and I, I ended up writing a story uh, which is called Shukol, and this is just um, a tiny little piece from the um, uh, thing. It's about a woman in the west of Ireland. It sounds complicated, but it's actually quite simple. It's a woman in the west of Ireland, Irish woman in the west of Ireland, who's Jewish. Uh, she translates from the Hebrew to the English. Um, she has a she speak, She's in the Gale Top, which is an Irish speaking area, and she has a Russian-born son. Um, yeah, it's complicated. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> A novella had arrived from the publisher in Tel Aviv eight months before, a beautifully written story by an Arab Israeli from Nazareth, an important piece of work, she thought. She had begun immediately to translate it, the story of a middle-aged couple who had lost their two children. She had come upon the word shukol. She cast around for a word to translate it, but there was no proper match. There were words, of course, for widow, widower, and orphan, but no noun, no adjective, for a parent who had lost a child. Not in Irish either. She looked in Russian, in French, 
in German, in other languages too, but could find analogues only in Sanskrit, Vilama, and in Arabic, Takla, a mother, Matkul, a father, still none in English. It bothered her for days. She wanted to be true to the text, to identify the invisible, torn open, ripped apart, stolen. And in the end, she settled upon the former word, bereaved. Not precise enough, she thought. No mystery to it, no music, hardly a proper translation at all, bereaved. Thank you. I read long enough at all, um, but um, if I didn't, I can read a little bit more later on. But I think um, it'd be nice to uh, open it up to, to questions, if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Do you like music? I love music. What, what music do you love that you're drawn to? I'm, because I have an observation I'll make once I hear that. Um, well, <laughs> I, be I believe that all literature should be music. I think that 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 that, that, that um, the music is sometimes more important than the meaning, and the music actually suggests the meaning. The music suggests a deeper meaning than one can actually say on the surface. That that you can be conscious of what it is that you want to say, but if you get the music of the moment right, you will get the texture of the stuff uh, right. So I listen to. Lots of different stuff, but, but like if I'm writing, I'd be listening to, say, Van Morrison. A lot of Van Morrison. I listen to uh, David Gray, Lisa Hannigan. Uh, you know, I listen sometimes to some classical music as well, uh, and sometimes I just leave it in silence. If I want to write about Russia, I might r listen to. Uh, I don't know. Um, Shostakovich. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me just say then, listening to you do your reading, I was thinking, trying to articulate what how it was different than most of the readings I hear and I was thinking it's almost like listening to music the first time I've heard it like that so that's uh, that's very cool yeah, yeah. And, and, and I go around the house and um, sometimes reading my own stuff <laughs> and my kids go oh geez there goes daddy talking bad words and um, like when I wrote Let the Great World Spin my son Johnny Michael went, uh, uh, I went to a school bag one morning, he was about probably about nine years old or ten years old. And I picked it up and it was super heavy. And I was like, John Michael, what's going on? He said, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, and um, I opened it up and it was like, I don't know, four or five copies of hardback copies. Uh, that's very important detail there, hardback copies <laughs> uh, of uh, Let Great World Spin. And I said, what are you doing, man? And he said, I'm sorry, sorry Dad, I'm bringing it down to school to show all my friends the F-U-K-R <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I think it's weird now, because uh, actually this summer, my son um, actually read my work for the first time. So he was reading, uh, and he had to read Dancer, which is like a really naughty book in, 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 in lots of places. Um, <laughs> but I have a really strong relationship with him. and. Um, it's odd when your children start to read your work. My my eighteen year old daughter, she hasn't she, she, she won't go near or at least she told me that she won't go near. Her. <laughs> yeah. Maybe privately she didn't. I think it must be odd. To, well, my dad was a writer, but uh, he, he didn't write fiction, so he, he didn't get into the, the, the weirdly secret uh, compartments in the in, in the back of the brain, you know. So, another question or comment or idea. <laughs> Um, my friend and I here have been talking about writing tonight over dinner, and we want to know when you write and what your writing process is like. When do I write, and uh, what is my um, writing process like? My favorite time to write is like early in the morning, dream time, just when you wake up out of bed and you're not like polluted by the day by all the like the news and the you know uh, and, and and the internet. I, if I could ban myself from the internet early in the morning, I'd be a very happy person. Uh, not check the soccer scores from the night before. <laughs> and um, and um, it's a fantastic time. And if you can get like two hours, uh, that's that's wonderful. And then the the real world intrudes, and and it sort of like get kids off to bed and or kids off to school and 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 and. and uh, I lived this terribly mannered, housebroken life. Got to look after the dog, and you know, that's <laughs> sort of thing. Um, and then come back in uh, again around nine o'clock, uh, and uh, work for a couple of hours. That would be fantastic till noon. Maybe go for a run. 
and then in the afternoon do some editing and um, and you don't allow yourself the first glass of wine of the day until <laughs> four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> four o'clock is a perfect time. Because <laughs> it could last only for an hour or so or it could last the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, first I want to thank you for your treatment of women characters. Um, when I read Transatlantic, I've read three of your books in the last year and I didn't You're know You're a for punishment. <laughs> 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 yeah. So uh, I'm in the bathtub reading Transatlantic and, and there's, there's a section about the, uh, the mother who's uh, looking at the possibility of losing her home. Mm. And I started to cry, not because she's losing her home and I know what that would feel like, but uh, because you seem to have a non-stereotypical uh, perspective on women, particularly older women, that <coughs> it was like she had a whole personality that didn't have to do with her children and, uh, and um, worrying about dinner. And sometimes older women get like, there's, there's these cardboard personalities in male authors' books. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate yeah. that. Well, thank you. And, and then the a thing I wanted to ask you is when you are working on a historical piece, uh, I can tell you do a lot of research. And now with regard to, like for instance with Dancer, um, how much does your research inform the personality? Mm. Oh, wow. So that's Two things came up, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you a story that I've never really told before. I don't think I've really told to anybody. But when I was in my mid 20s, I remember going to my aunt's house, and my aunt was living in New Jersey, and I met this, uh, she had this friend, this older woman, um, who uh, uh, had photos of herself when she was younger uh, around the house, and she told me that she'd been involved in the jazz era, and um, she'd, she'd been married to this beautiful jazz musician. And I sort of fell in love with her. I was in my mid twenties, and she was in her late sixties. <laughs> uh, and uh, and you know, just the whole idea of it was was, was so deep to me that then, um, and then um, you know, nowadays I can uh, I can understand that. John Berger says, if I'd have known as a child what the life of an adult would have been, I never would have believed it. I never could have believed it would be so unfinished. Mm. And I love that idea that we're constantly unfinished. So I arrive at 50 and I'm con I, if I had like, like, thought about myself when I was 20 and said when I was going to be fin 50, I'd definitely be finished at the age of 50, right? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> now you arrive here now and like um, it's completely unfinished. Um, and, um, and I don't know why it is that, 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 that I'm drawn to write uh, women characters, except I do think I do it better uh, than male characters. Don't know why. Uh, and I enjoy it more. Maybe there's a more complex emotional wardrobe there. I'm not really sure what it is. I, I don't can tell you what it is. What <laughs> is. <laughs> You're Irish, right? <laughs> Were you raised in Ireland? Mm -hmm. The Irish love women. <laughs> women have a huge, uh, revered influence. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, the mother is it, the, the, the mother is a big deal. I, I do think, in, certainly, you're hitting on something. I mean, um, I went to the school um, called Conkey College, and I see uh, Justin down here. Uh, 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 who also uh, <coughs> knows uh, the, the, the whole background there. Um, uh, and I used to go home for lunch uh, every, uh, every afternoon and I would sit with my mum for 45 minutes. Every single day I would sit with her. She was ready and she would have like sandwiches ready, lettuce and tomato sandwiches with the crust cut off and a cup of tea. <laughs> and I would sit and talk with her. And I didn't think any big deal of it at, the, at, at that stage. But I think now that that, that, that may... And also, <coughs> I had, um, my sister used to, my older sister Siobhan used to take me uh, uh, out and about. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, uh, a good enough explanation. As I said, I think I'd rather like keep it um, as a mystery. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, I certainly don't want to sit on that Freudian couch. And say, <laughs> <laughs> but in relation to, to, to how how it um, how it deepens the characters. Uh, you know, the research really deepens the characters. And, and, and uh, I think when you do research, the most important thing is sometimes to find the most extreme detail. We're talking of, 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 of women. So I was um, uh, with my daughter, Isabella, and I was writing a book called Dancer, which is a fictionalization of the life of Rudolf Nureyev. 
and she was about three or four years old and we went to the Nutcracker in New York and I remember like looking at the stage and um, the snow was coming down and it was all very beautiful and Isabella grabbed my hand and she squeezed my hand mm. and she said, uh, Daddy, are they really real? Mm. You know, like 50 dancers up there. And I'm, my heart was melting. I thought, ah, oh, isn't that beautiful? I can't wait to talk to these dancers who I'm sort of researching now um, and tell them this beautiful story about my daughter. So I go tell the dancers about the story and they say, that's the worst moment of the show. <laughs> I'm like, what? What do you mean? They say, okay, you have to understand this, the snow is coming down, right? The snow has got to go back up into the net after it comes down. <laughs> so the stagehands come on at the end of the show, they sweep up the, 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 the snow, which is paper snow, and there's like dust in it, and mouse droppings, and like pegs of earrings, and, the, and they're, they're dancing and getting, getting bumped up there. <laughs> And I thought, what a beautiful, extreme detail. Only a, only a dancer would know. So the thing is, you use the extremity of detail to inform the character and to inform the, the fiction. And once you have that extremity of detail, other things sort of fit in. You know, part of writing is about smoke and mirrors. Like um, this character, Mendelssohn, he's a judge. If I can find something that makes the reader think that I know that he was a judge, rather than being like, he did this, no, no, no. Uh, one detail, then they, they'll trust me, that, 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 that I know the other details that, that are there. And um, mm -hmm. you know, that is a little bit of a, a disappointing secret to, um, to, to readers. I shouldn't have told you, sorry. <laughs> 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 it's not disappointing to me. No, no, when I read a book, I read the whole thing. I mean, I, I feel like I'm really with the characters, right. you know, that I've invited them to my house. I want to like them, sometimes I don't, and I read fast through the parts where I don't like them. <laughs> but like with, with Nuria, I love most of the characters in the book, except him. Right. And, yeah, he wasn't designed to yeah, and then, I, then I started thinking, this is a work of fiction, Francine. This is a work of fiction. Right. And I, I trust the author so much that I will believe just about every historical detail you put in there, including, you know, things he may have said or whatever, you right. know, like that. Didn't say. So, gentleman behind. Uh, I was listening. You're watching a video this morning, an interview of you regarding Ulysses from a few years ago, mm. and in that interview you uh, mentioned that in a way all of your stories are Irish stories, mm -hmm. whether it's Narita or Wally or any of those. Just what do you what do you mean by that? That's very important to me. Okay. So um you know I have the guilt of the emigrant. Uh, like the person who has who, who has gone, uh, there is a huge amount of guilt in, in having uh, left your country. And sometimes I think we go in order to remember. Certainly, years ago, like um, you know, the Joyces and the Becketts of the world went back in order to remember specifically what was happening back in the, 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 our, our own country. I left in order to um, talk about outside, but have the outside, whether it be Nuriev or Zoli or uh, you know, whatever it happens to be, become a reflection of an Irish idea. I can't be anything but an Irish writer. I carry an American passport and an Irish passport. I feel enormously guilty, and even if I go to Dublin Airport, right, I always put the purple uh, passport over the blue passport. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and um, you know, I have this relationship to this idea of of, of, of exile uh, and, um, and, and loss and longing and, and belonging. And I don't know whether I've really, like, like properly sort of answered your question, but um, it's important for me to say that uh, I am always sort of going home, always going home. Um, now, uh, the other thing that's interesting to me in relation to that is that um, Green Moore, a fantastic Irish writer who lived in Canada and ended up living out here in California in um, Santa Monica, I believe. He uh, was. He said, you know where you're from when you know where it is that you want to be buried. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he wanted to be buried on a headland in Northern Ireland. And indeed, for all those years of exile, he went back and he was buried in the headland in, in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Me, 
personally, I want to be scattered, like all over the place. <laughs> and a part of me would be on the Golden Gate, you know, <laughs> and just like scattered, scattered in and around the place. But so it's an attempt to understand where I'm from. The other story about that is, and my favorite thing about like where are you from, is that uh, who knows the, the, the great uh, writer John Berger. Some people must know John Berger. He wrote Ways of Seeing, uh, G, uh, To the Wedding, and uh, he won the Booker Prize in 1972. Anyway, he's one of my great heroes. He's in his 80s now. He lives in the south of France. Uh, anyway, um, I was with him one night in Paris, and we were uh, colloquially overserved. <laughs> <laughs> As does happen. And um, so I said to him, John, where are you from? And he's a good friend of mine. Now, you know the way when you're a bit drunk, you say, where are you from? Right. This is well. I'm from London. You know, uh, yeah, I was born in. Uh, I said, I know where. I know you're from London. I said, where are you from? From. <laughs> <laughs> You've been there, right? Uh, and he says to me, he said the most beautiful thing. He said, he said, I am a citizen. Then he paused a long time. He's a very serious, brilliant man. He says, no, 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 no. I am a patriot of elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I want to be, patriot, a patriot of elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Lots of good stories around about Sorry, I saw another hand down there. It's by, oh, one uh, you talked about your father was a writer, but not of fiction. And, uh, and you also said on your uh, Viking tour that you didn't have anything for five years worth writing about, right. or didn't know how to do it. Right. Uh, at what point did you consider yourself a writer? I mean, is that from youth on, so you're always a writer all your life in a, in a sort of hidden, ineffective way until you, um, until, until you write? Did you write successfully I never, thereafter? I never admitted to being a writer until I was sort of in my 40s and I had about uh, five books on, on, on my belt. <laughs> yeah, I certainly didn't admit to it when, when I was in my late 20s and I had my first book around. I was always a teacher. Um, in my head I was always a writer. Mm -hmm. and since eight years old I was always a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, you know, when, when I was a journalist I said I want, wanted to be uh, a writer. Um, but sometimes I still think I'm not a, a, a writer. I'm not being coy when I say that. Because sometimes when you finish a novel, uh, you think, I'm exhausted, I have nothing else to write. They're going to find me out, I'm a charlatan, I'm, I'm done, and um, you know, I won't be able to, 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 to write again. So the question of like, you know, what is a writer and what does he or she uh, happen to do is always sort of constantly on my mind. But I think, um, like, uh, I kind of knew it when I was about eight when I wrote an essay, and, and the teacher asked me to read it out in front of the class about my grandfather, and I thought, wow, there's something, there's something in this. Uh, but then I, I probably didn't really, really uh, say it. And of course, even nowadays, it's very, it's, 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 a, it, it's, it's, it's um, very interesting. You go to a party in New York, and people say, what do you do? Yeah, and you say, I'm a writer. And inevitably, if there's a couple there, uh, and there's a lot of men in the audience, so apologies to them. But 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 the, the woman always says, "Oh, that's fantastic," and the men go, "Oh yeah, I know. I don't read fiction." And then say, I say, "What do you read?" And, like, and, and I say, "Ask me what you what you to watch." And they say, "Fox Five News." And I said, "That's fiction." <laughs> But it, but, but, but it is interesting that there is sort of this male provenance towards supposed non-fiction uh, and this female provenance towards fiction, which is entirely skewed, really, because non-fiction is fiction. It really is. And it's probably, fiction means, from, from the word fictus, to shape, and uh, uh, non-fiction is more shaped, uh, I think, than, than, than fiction is sometimes. And, and, and I like that. Um, I, I like that tension. I actually don't think the word fiction is very good at all. I like the word story and storytelling, right. uh, and that's the, and, 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 and that's where the, the real stuff comes in. We we'll will get a couple more questions. Are we okay? I think one here. And so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the great world spin and then the beginning there's the wonderful uh, Jane sentence. Some of my favorite sentences I've ever read. Is about the description of, of New York in that moment. And I'm wondering how you did that, and how you do that. How do you write a list like that? That it truly is musical, but it also appeals to all the senses. There's all kinds of rustlings and ringings and just the sounds and, and 
My, my job is to put you in a moment. My job is to, to work that sentence so that it seems like it's easy, and to like just sort of lifts off the page, and then you're not like struggling with it too much. Um, I, 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 and yet there must be a certain amount of difficulty there. There must be like that joy of difficulty that, 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 that you have to inhabit. Um, and then the, uh, to put a music again uh, on the page so that people can sort of feel it. And, 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 uh, and I don't want to say anything to anybody. I don't think I'm smart enough to, 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 to uh, literally say anything. Um, but I think I am smart enough to allow people to think and that's part of my that's part of my job or my chore or my my uh, dilemma to to paint a picture, allow the reader to walk into the picture, and he or she then wanders around and interprets it uh, for uh, herself or, or or himself. That's that's the thing that I really want to do. Uh, and then I just like words. I just really like words, and and, 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 and I like the great writers who do it, and some do it so much better than I could even dream of, like Joyce, and the, like a, like a, a Doctorow, and a DeLillo, and Tony Morris, and all these people that I just I truly adore. So, yeah. And it's fun, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. How about it? Oh, thank you. Um, what are you reading these days? Yeah. Well, <coughs> I'm going to Israel next month, um, and I'm going to the West Bank. Uh, and uh, I want to explore that territory, that, that region. So I'm reading uh, David Grossman, James Oz, Asaf Kavron, I'm reading the Palestinian writers, I'm reading uh, all sorts of stuff that's going on uh, over there. And um, I read the work of my students. Uh, Phil Cly won the National oh. Book Award uh, a couple of years ago. He was one of my students. Uh, I also uh, happened to teach and sort of quasi-mentor uh, uh, Marlon James, uh, who just won the Booker Prize, and I'm so happy to, to see those students come along. Um, I don't think I can teach them anything at all. I don't know anything about plot or dialogue or anything else, but I do like um, sort of talk about fire and stamina and, and determination. Um, and um, then when I read the work of my students, when it comes out, I'm much happier than even when my own stuff comes out because you know there's no baggage involved. It's just great. It's like fantastic. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, like I, uh, so uh, w w when one of my students comes along and writes a novel, that's one of my my, my happiest times. So I read a lot of that stuff, and of course I keep on reading the great ones like Michael and Dache, you know, and and and. and, and my colleague Peter Carey and uh, and I hate to talk like oh um, my friend Joseph O'Connor and, and mm -hmm. people like that and it's like and if I start mentioning too many names and I'll leave some of the alcohol and sort of guilty I'll wait at four o'clock this morning to go, Oh my god <laughs> I mentioned so and so and she's gonna be pissed at me or whatever that is. Um, but, um, uh, and um, oh actually he's not here tonight. T J Sells. Um, he was here uh, two years ago. I just read, read his new book um, about Custer. Um, mm -hmm. It's really, really, really good. Um, you know, he's uh, he's one of your locals, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who informed you as you were journeying along, looking for your voice, which you've obviously found a wonderful voice as it is, uh, as you became a writer? Who, who informed you? My father informed me. Um, um, what writers? What writers inform me? Um, you know, I started out with like sort of uh, obscure writers. I, li I liked a guy called Donald Hayes from Arkansas, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called The Dixie Association. Um, Jim Dodge, who wrote a book called Fup, California book. Um, I, I found all these like supposedly semi obscure uh, books as I went along. But um, in my early Years it was like the beats. So it was Fern and Getty, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Ginsburg, all, right. uh, yeah, all, all, all of those guys. So they, they were so important to me. So when I was reading Kesey and, 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 and uh, all that stuff, that was uh, that was enormously, enormously important to me. So I went to the beats, and then I went back to the Irish ones, and then sort of like uh, branched out from there. I always think the beats are really good for a, a younger writer. Uh, and um, I still have enormous respect. I was in City Lights today, just for a few minutes. What a bookshop that is. Yeah, it really is. You see that in your work too. Thank you. Yeah, the, the beats are very important. But 
Do we have time for two more? Yes, Are yes, you let's sure? do it. Okay, yes. I don't want to keep people too long. Yeah. Yeah. Down here? Um, so many authors dress up reality, and when I read your writings, <coughs> you dress it down to the core, and, um, and, and I think that's what touches me, and I wonder what it's like for you as the writer to get down to the core of mm. humanity. Well, that's a beautiful way. Can I steal mm. that? Like, <laughs> 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 down. It's, it's so good. Uh, listen, you know, I, I, my, my job is to look at, the, at, at, at what, what is real and, and, and say it is dark, it is dreary, it is tough, it is unimaginably difficult to be human. Uh, to you know, to try to survive, to deal with aging, to deal with the uh, territory, to all these things. And, and to get down with the, with, 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 with the very best cynic in the world and agree with her or agree with him to say, yes, the world is shitty. And then for me to step away and say, do you have anything else to say about this? And, no. and then and to find something new to say about it, to find something good, to find something redemptive <coughs> uh, about reality, to find um, some sort, something that's beyond the available cynicism of, and the easy cynicism. And I have to tell you that I feel it's much more muscular and much more difficult and, uh, uh, to be a, a, an optimist or to be somebody who actually believes that, 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 that something good can come out of uh, uh, what we do. Um, people talk about this stuff as being airy-fairy and so on. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that, that, that to be somebody who believes in, uh, uh, in human nature uh, takes a powerful amount of energy beyond uh, cynicism. And that's why I'm involved in a group called Narrative 4, 4, four being the, um, the numeral 4. Please go on to narrative4.com, check us out. We got, um, it's a, it's um, a group of uh, writers and activists uh, bolstered by teachers and then bolstered by students. So we, get, we take kids from around the world and they come together and they tell one another stories. So I would step into your shoes, you would step, what's your name? Arlene. Arlene? Arlene. Arlene. So if I was with you in a group, and I would hear your story, right, and, uh, and, and I would go back to the group, and then I would get up and tell your story and say, hi, my name is Arlene, when I was 15 years old, blah, 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 whatever happened to me. And, and it is the most powerful thing. When you realize that your story is valuable, right, to another person, and then and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. This exchange of stories is, is to me one of the most powerful things that we can do um, uh, around the world. So anybody who's interested should go onto onto narrative4.com and, and see what it is that we're doing. It's the uh, uh, I've never seen anything work quite like it, and we have all sorts of authors who who are involved in it uh, around the world. In fact, around the world. Mm -hmm. So please check it out. So when the question is, when I moved to America, did, did I did, did it change the way I wrote? Yes. Where are you from? Yeah. County Meath. Whereabouts in County Meath? Mm -hmm. Huh? Right. Trim. When you moved to America, did it change the way you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I think it did. Yes. Um, it gave me an ability to to think in different ways. Uh, I, I, I know that I would not be the same writer that I am today uh, if I had stayed in Ireland and, 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 and I don't think I would have been quite as ambitious. That's not a compliment to America necessarily, but it's a compliment to the fact that you have to go. You have to leave sometimes. Certain writers don't. Like Roddy Doyle never left and he's still doing brilliant stuff. Joseph O'Connor never left. Uh, and he's still doing brilliant stuff. Glenn Patterson, you know, all, Dermot Bolger, all these people uh, uh, who are doing fantastic work. They, they, they did, but for me personally, yes, I had to leave, and it did change the way uh, that I wrote. And we began to listen in in in, 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 di in different ways um, as well. So um, uh, um, I, I think going sort of helped me um, uh, a good deal. Um, and I'm reminded of the words of Joyce. He said, "I've been so long out of Ireland." that I all at once hear her voice in everything. Which is a nice, a nice way to think about it. And I think we have, are we all right? We have one last question here. Do you read nonfiction? And if so, have you read anything uh, Winston Churchill has written? 
Winston Churchill, who the hell is he? <laughs> No, you know what? I should read Winston Churchill, and, and, and I've read some of the greatest quotes that, 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 that yeah. you know, he has fantastic quotes, um, and I should read more of Winston Churchill. I was reminded though of um, Disraeli who said, uh, if, you, if you want to know anything about anything, write a book about it. Right? Um, and um, I think uh, Churchill was, 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 was uh, pretty ambitious, and yes, I do read uh, lots of non-fiction, but I have, I, I'm entirely ignorant of uh, what uh, Churchill uh, was about. I probably should go back in and, and, and figure some of that out. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank you all very much for...